This afternoon, breaking news. Fears our state could be plunged into darkness within hours. The plan to secure our power supply. A pub patron sent flying onto a main road in a violent scuffle with police. Did officers go too far? A hefty jail sentence for a northern suburbs child care sex predator. Payday, thousands of South Australians set to receive another $40 a week. And the fitting tribute for an SA great, Russell Ebert, elevated to AFL legend. Live from Adelaide, 7 News with Mike Smithson. Good afternoon. We begin with breaking news and South Australia's energy crisis has taken an unprecedented turn. The national regulator has announced it's taking control of the country's electricity market for the first time in history. It comes amid fresh warnings parts of our state could be plunged into darkness within hours. Here's Andrea Nicholas. We managed to get through last night unscathed, but warnings about potential outages here this afternoon and for the rest of the week have been coming through thick and fast. The Energy Minister spent last night in crisis talks with the National Regulator seeking reassurance for South Australians. He says so far our state's renewables have helped us avoid a blackout. Were it not for our wind farms, were it not for our solar reserves, were it not for rooftop solar and our big batteries, South Australia could have been in trouble. But Tom Kutzentonis maintains the national market is broken, with generators able to pull supply from the grid whenever they like. If we do reach crisis point here, this is where the lights will go out first, in Adelaide's west, with Woodville Gardens, Pennington, St Clair and Bowdoin among the most at risk. I think it'd be very, very unlikely. There is sufficient supply, they're just not participating in the market. This afternoon, the regulator forced their hand, suspending the wholesale energy market for the first time, taking control of generator supply into the grid. To make sure that we have clear visibility on which generators are available and when in advance ahead of time. The Premier says we wouldn't be in this mess if the state's backup diesel generators weren't sold off. We can now call on those reserves in order to prevent any potential outages in South Australia. Those uh, diesel generators can be directed on where required. We'll have the latest blackout warnings for South Australia in our next bulletin at six. A childcare sex predator who abused children in his care then begged for leniency has been sentenced to 14 years in prison. Bronte Sirakovich has been labelled every parent's worst nightmare and today his victims' families were emotional to see him finally punished. Kimberly Pratt was in court. As the crushing sentence was handed down here at the district court this morning, victims' families had an audible reaction, shouting yes inside the courtroom. Former childcare worker Bronte Sirakovic was sentenced to a maximum 14 years in prison for committing vile sex acts on four children, two of whom were in his care at a northern suburbs childcare centre. The father of two was arrested in September 2020 after a seven-year-old victim came forward. Sirakovic finally admitted to his hideous crimes more than 12 months later when he then pleaded for leniency. He hadn't just abused his victims, but filmed it too. Judge Tim Heffernan described the now 31-year-old as a serious repeat offender and a danger to the community, adding he's shown little remorse. You've offered no apology to your victims, he said, or their families, your colleagues or the community at large. One mother, who we can't identify, says his punishment comes as a relief, but she still has nightmares about him and finds it hard to trust people because of the abhorrent things he's done. Sirakovic will be eligible for parole just before Christmas in 2031, at which time his own children will be adults. A youth court judge has visited the site where three members of one family were tragically killed near Mount Gambier in 2020. Judge Penny Aldridge inspected a section of the Princess Highway, the scene of a horror head-on smash which came to the lives of well-known Millicent locals Ned and Nan Walker and their daughter Sue Skier. A 17-year-old autistic learner driver is standing trial over the deaths. A court's heard he wasn't concentrating that day, instead he was thinking of school. Seven News has obtained vision of a violent scuffle between police and pub patrons in Adelaide's East. As Rosie Barnett reports, 
Questions are being asked if officers went too far. The violence erupted here in the car park outside the Maiden Magpie Hotel in Stepney. Phone vision capturing the moment police tried to detain a young man who was one of a large group who'd been kicked out of the pub after causing a disturbance on Sunday night. Witnesses claim police went too far. A 20-year-old was pushed onto the road by an officer and pulled along the pavement, suffering what he says were injuries to his ribs. The group also claims many of them were pepper sprayed while they were just watching on. The officers' actions have been referred to SA Police's Ethical Professional Standards Branch, responsible for coordinating internal investigations. Police had been called to the hotel after a jug was thrown at a staff member. A 21-year-old man from Fairview Park was arrested and charged with disorderly behaviour. The hotel says staff here were overall pleased with the way police handled the disturbance. A 23-year-old man has been airlifted to the Royal Adelaide Hospital with serious injuries after a car hit a tree on York Peninsula. He was a rear passenger in a Monaro which left the road near Waruka last night. The driver and another passenger received minor injuries. York Highway was closed for a short time. South Australians will be getting a pay rise of $40 a week after the Fair Work Commission agreed to lift the minimum wage. The decision was made to ensure those on the lowest incomes can keep up with the rising cost of living. Jennifer Beshwari has the latest. Well, some good news for workers today. The national minimum wage will soon increase by $40 a week or just over $1 an hour. This takes the minimum wage to $21.38 per hour or $812.60 per week. It's an increase of 5.2%, which is above headline inflation. It means about 180,000 workers on the minimum wage will get that full increase. A further 2.5 million workers on award wages will also get a pay rise, many coming into effect from July 1. But for people in hospitality, tourism and aviation, it won't start until October. The unions are pleased with the decision. They had asked for 5.5 per cent but say it's a fair and reasonable increase and will help struggling individuals keep up with the rising cost of living. Business groups disagree. They believe the increase is too high and many business owners won't be able to afford paying staff. Extra $40 a week is going to make um, a significant uh, difference. Uh, especially if you consider the basics because if you're on the absolute minimum all of your wage is spent on the basics going to mean that people will actually be able to buy the food they need for their families. That cost will be an extra 7.9 billion dollars uh, hitting the bottom line uh, of affected businesses as a result of this decision. That will add to inflationary pressures. So they are going to have to look at passing on those costs uh, to consumers. This was the bedrock of the Labor election campaign. They argued that wages should not go backwards to keep up with inflation. One of the government's first acts since coming to power was to write to the Fair Work Commission to increase wages. Speaking in Gladstone today after a cabinet meeting, the Prime Minister welcomed the decision, saying hard-working, low-income earners will now have some extra cash in their pockets. It makes a difference to people who are struggling with the cost of living. The truth is that many of those people who are on the minimum wage are the heroes who saw us through the pandemic. These workers deserve more than our thanks. They deserve a pay rise and today they've got it. People will be seeing in their bank accounts what the change of government means. People will be seeing in their bank accounts a wage increase that never would have happened back when we had a government committed and determined to keep wages deliberately low. Politically, this is a big win for Anthony Albanese, who can now say that he's delivered on his election promise. And the local share market lost further ground today. The ASX 200 closing at 6,599 points. That's down more than 7% in the past five days. It's a new low for at least the past year. And as Gemma Acton reports, it's now hurting our super returns. 
Good afternoon. After all of yesterday's share market drama, today was a quieter day. Uh, but usually after you see a very steep sell-off, the next day you're looking to see a recovery of sorts. The ASX 200 could not deliver that today. It was another down day with the index closing down around 1.3%. Some of the hardest hit stocks yesterday were under pressure again today, including Afterpay owner Block and online jobs platform Seek. However, mining giant Fortescue, which lost 6% yesterday, has now clawed back some of those losses. Although all else equal, rising interest rates help banks to grow their profits. It has been a tough week for financial services companies. They've fallen around 12% since last week's RBA rate rise. That's on fears stretched consumers will struggle to pay off their debts and the property market is expected to take a hit. If you're positioned uh, with the miners and the oil and gas companies, you're doing very well and I think they'll continue to do well into this recovery. Super experts say after the recent bumpy ride for markets, any positive returns for the average super fund gained earlier in the year could be washed out by June 30th. We've seen a, a lot of ups and downs uh, during the financial year and it looks like we're ending in neg negative territory if the current trend continues. That follows a return of close to 18% last year and an annual average return of around 7% since the super system was first launched. Thanks for that, Gemma. Fire crews have saved a $2 million prospect house from ruin after a suspected arson attack. The blaze started near pallets in the garage of the La Hunda Avenue house around 2am. A suspect with a torch was caught on camera moments before the fire broke out. A man's been arrested after a break-in at Marion. Police were called to the Whittier Avenue when, uh, that's a house of course, when neighbours heard noises coming from a partially demolished property just before 1am. Officers found copper piping had been removed from the roof. A 57-year-old man was found hiding in a back room. Socceroos are on their way home after qualifying for the World Cup, beating Peru in a nail-biter of a game early yesterday morning. Matt Shervington is at Sydney Airport this afternoon. And Shervo, not long now until the squad touches yeah. down. Yeah, that's right. A handful of Socceroos players will arrive here in the next hour or so and they're going to get a hero's welcome. Family, friends and fans are eagerly awaiting that arrival and it's all off the back of that 5-4 penalty shootout win over Peru which secured their place in the World Cup yesterday morning. It's their fifth appearance for the Socceroos at a World Cup since 2006. Five players, including Captain Matt Ryan, will be here. Adelaide's own Awa Mabil, who scored a goal in that penalty shootout. And the man of the moment, replacement goalie and Andrew Redmayne, will also be here. And what about that? He has become an overnight sensation. He saved two goals to secure the win for Australia, and he's etched his name in Australian sporting folklore. Not too dissimilar to John Aloisi in 2005. We are hoping maybe we'll get to see his wife, Caitlin, and one-year-old daughter, Poppy, possibly because that celebration and the face that he put on when Australia finally got the win apparently is the same one that he uses to put a smile on little Poppy's face when he's at home. So maybe we'll see that this afternoon as well. Quick turnaround for the Socceroos, of course. Many players going back into club duties and they build up to the World Cup in November. They take on Denmark, Tunisia in the pool. And Mike, of course, a tough one to start it all off. They take on France, the reigning World Cup champions on November 23. Thanks, Matt. Still recovering myself. The old Holden site at Elizabeth South today took on a whole new look, as Mitchell Sariofsky reports. It was the scene of an army training exercise which left no stone unturned. It's been nearly five years since Holden shut up shop here at Elizabeth. But today, the army put its abandoned factory to good use. Seven News was given rare access to the training exercise which took weeks to plan and just a few hours to execute. During the simulation, the troops were ordered to raid the building and deal with whatever they encountered inside. These soldiers are from the 7th RAR unit and were deployed to Afghanistan in 2012 for Operation Slipper. This is one of a handful of key battle simulations carried out each year. Basically we're using the old Holden facility because it offers a pretty unique training environment for my soldiers and uh, my commanders and planners to uh, go through the process of planning and executing attacks in a complex urban environment. These troops have just returned from helping with the East Coast flood emergency. This exercise will have them ready for combat when the need arises. 
The mass mandate at Adelaide Airport could be scrapped as early as this week. The Australian Health Protection Principal Committee has recommended scrapping the rule at airports right across the country. Adelaide Airport says it's awaiting SA Health advice. Mask would still be required on planes. Weather-wise, and it's been a soggy day at times across the city today. Amelia joins us live in the studio and Mills. Just how much rain have we seen? Well, Mike, showers by nature are hit and miss, and we've certainly seen that at times today. While the West Terrace gauge has picked up a couple of millimetres since 9am, the gauge at Norlunga has seen less than half a millimetre. Patches in our northern suburbs have seen about that as well. Meanwhile, Mount Lofty has picked up around 17. Now, as per usual, the hills did pick up the best falls since those showers began rolling through last night. Generally, most parts saw 10 to 20 millimetres by 9am, collecting another 10 or more today. In the city, our total is around 7 millimetres, and that takes our total for the month so far to 79. Now, cloud is still dominating the hills this afternoon, so a road weather alert is in place with drivers there asked to take extra care in low visibility. Got dry skies ahead, though. More on that in the forecast soon. Mike. Thanks, Mills. We'll catch you a bit later. Despite today's minimum wage boost, there could still be some tough times ahead. Up next, the latest interest rate warning. Plus, Amber Heard speaks out why she's standing by her allegations against Johnny Depp China floods, a six-hour operation to save an elderly villager trapped inside their home. And the morning dip movement, why hundreds of South Aussies are taking the icy plunge at Henley Beach. Despite today's minimum wage boost, the country's top bankers warning we need to be prepared for more tough times ahead. As Chris Reason reports, the Reserve Bank Governor predicts inflation could soar to levels not seen in 32 years. Good afternoon, that's right. It's rare that we see the Reserve Bank Governor make any public statements at all unless there is extreme significance and they certainly were that. Predictions of a 7% inflation rate and also threats of spiking interest rate hikes to bring the economy back under control with the costs of living now soaring on many levels including power and petrol, groceries and gas. We've seen the inflation rate hit 5.1% in the March quarter but the prediction was that that number would surge. Dr Lowe saying that it would reach 7% by the end of the year. Pushed along by COVID supply issues, the Ukraine war and now today's minimum wage increase also adding to inflation pressures as well. Of course, interest rate rises are the key tool for the RBA to try and uh, cool the economy. We've already seen them raise rates twice in the past two meetings, lifting the official rate from its pandemic low of 0.1% up to 0.85%. Those hikes quickly passed on by the retail banks. But Dr Lowe said in an overnight ABC interview he needed to quote do what was necessary to bring that inflation number back down. Inflation's high. It's too high. At the moment, it's 5%, and by the end of the year, I expect inflation to get to 7%. That's a very high number, and we need to be able to chart a course back to 2 to 3% inflation. It's unclear at the moment how far interest rates will need to go up to get that. I think it's reasonable that in interest rates get to, the cash rate gets to 2.5% at some point. Now, Dr Lowe said he realised the impact the rate hikes would have on mortgage holders, but also noted that many Australians relying on savings would welcome an interest rate increase. His prediction was that the bank's measures tied in with global factors would start to see inflation numbers come back down off a peak between January and March next year. Back to you. Thanks, Chris. To the US now, and Amber Heard's refusing to back down after losing her defamation trial against ex-husband Johnny Depp. In her first sit-down interview since the trial, the actress blamed a social media onslaught for swaying the verdict. US Bureau Chief Ashley Mullaney reports. After a jury ruled that Amber Heard defamed her ex-husband, Johnny Depp, by claiming he abused her, she has now levelled those allegations at him again. To my dying day, we'll stand by every word of my testimony. We get the concept of free speech from the Greeks. My understanding of what that means is not just the freedom to speak. It's a freedom to speak truth to power. Yeah. And that's all I spoke. And I spoke it to power and I paid the price. In a talk show interview this morning, Amber Heard said she was unfairly okay. treated, that the social media the uh, onslaught the must have impacted the verdict. Never. I think even the most well-intentioned juror, it would have been impossible to avoid this. 
In this interview, she said that when you're living with violence, you have to learn to adapt. It wasn't at times a tense interview. Savannah Guthrie, the breakfast show host, uh, pointing out audio where Amber Heard could be heard, uh, saying that she started some of these fights. What you would hear in those clips are not evidence of what was happening. It was evidence of a negotiation of how to talk about that with your abuser. The actress admitted that the pair of them could have come across as Hollywood brats. She conceded that their relationship was toxic and ugly and that she wasn't entirely proud of her own uh, behaviour in that relationship too. Still, she's been ordered to pay more than $10 million to Johnny Depp, money that her lawyers say she simply cannot afford to pay and she plans to appeal the decision. Flood waters have inundated cities and villages in eastern China, cutting off roads and trapping people in houses. More than 22,000 people have been evacuated, including one elderly villager who had to be rescued during a six-hour operation. In some places, almost 100 millimetres of rain have fallen in 24 hours. Now, while most of us were still tucked up in bed this morning, more than 100 people braved the chill for a dawn dip at Henley. Salty Sips is back after a six-month hiatus. The popular swimmer had to be put on hold when organisers were hit with a double whammy of COVID and insurance troubles. It's so good to see everyone again and have the whole community back together. Absolutely incredible this morning. I just feel so alive with it all, really. Tonight, meet the Seven News Young Achievers who got the event back up and running. That's in our main bulletin at six. Great work by them. Now, Theo's here, and Theo at last, Russell Ebert, got what he richly deserves. Smith, though, we always knew, well, here in South Australia, now around the country, he was a legend. Officially, he's been immortalised with that status in the AFL's Hall of Fame, rightly so. We caught up with his son, Brett, to talk about the honour. We'll have that very shortly. And a key, a Crows trio back on deck ahead of Sunday's Suns clash on the Gold Coast. We'll have the latest on Josh Rochelle. Jordan Butts and Luke Brown as well. Plenty more sport coming up the Sabo Smith, though. Chock full. Good on you. Thanks, Theo. Ahead on 7 News, leaving London, why the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge are preparing for a big move. Plus, caught on camera, the big Australian retailers secretly recording customers. The legal movement to free an elephant from a New York zoo. And no meat in sight, the surprise winner of Australia's best pie. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge and their three children are reportedly set to leave their London apartment to be closer to the Queen. As European Bureau Chief Hugh Whitfeld reports, the move could happen within weeks. William and Kate have spent the day with the families of the victims of the Grenfell Tower fire tragedy five years after the deadly blaze tore through an apartment block here in London. As reports emerged, they're preparing to leave their Kensington Palace base not far from uh, Grenfell Tower for Adelaide Cottage, a four-bedroom house in the Windsor Great Park, very close to the Queen at Windsor Castle, close to Eton College where George and Louis might be heading one day, of course, where William and Harry went to high school and close to the Middletons, Kate's parents who live not far away in Berkshire. It would require a change in schools for the three Cambridge children. And this cottage doesn't need staff and it doesn't need renovations either. So it's considered the perfect fit for the young family. Meantime, a short carriage ride away from Windsor, Charles and Camilla have led the Royal Pack at Royal Ascot where racing has returned. They might have even watched an Aussie winner today. There was no sign of Her Majesty, though. Many of the Queen's horses running at Ascot later in the week. Thanks, Hugh. Three of Australia's major retailers are under fire after it was re revealed facial recognition technology is being used in their stores. As Evan Batten explains, the majority of customers aren't even aware it's happening. Good afternoon, Anne. Yeah, well, anyone who's walked into a major retailer and wondered how they're using their security camera vision that they're recording of you will be alarmed to learn that a number of major retailers are now admitting to using facial recognition software. Bunnings and Kmart are among them who say at this stage it's only for a trial. Choice asked 25 major retailers if they were using facial recognition technology after a tip-off by one of its members. They admitted to scanning the facial features of every customer who walks into the store and cross-checking it against a list of 
known individuals who may have been suspected of shoplifting or causing trouble in other ways. That does raise a lot of questions about the accuracy of this technology. We don't know how accurate it is. And Choice is ultimately asking for an investigation to be carried out by the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner to see if any breaches have occurred. Bunnings in response has said it's disappointed by Choice's research here, calling it an inaccurate characterisation of Bunnings' use of facial recognition technology. It's only used in selected stores, it says, and only to keep team members and customers safe. Kmart says much the same sort of thing. It stores the data only for 30 days or so. The Australia Institute, Anne, says it should all stop now until legal protections can be put in place. Happy the elephant will be staying at New York's Bronx Zoo. Animal rights activists had taken court action claiming Happy deserved some of the same rights as humans and should be set free. The court ruled while elephants are intelligent and deserve proper care and compassion, Happy doesn't have a legal right to liberty. The judge says if the petition had been successful, there would be a flood of applications to free animals, including pets and service animals. A mushroom pie has won the annual award for Australia's best pie. It contains three types of mushrooms, cheddar, parmesan, herbs and truffle and is wrapped in a golden flaky pastry. It's the first time a vegetarian pie has won the prize. Well, we'll cross live to Comsec next for the latest on your money. Plus, parental powers and new tools to keep your children safe online. And jumping into the history books, why these women have set a skydiving record. He was still in his capsule when he was found. To breaking news now. To know the news, you have to be there. 7 News was first on the scene. We take you there like no one else. Know the news. It was a remarkable rescue. Hail blanket parts of the hills. 7 News at 6 o'clock. Not even the rain could keep these riders from their bikes today. Plenty of people were spotted out and about along the River Torrens this afternoon. Watching Seven's Afternoon News live from Adelaide. Now recapping our top stories. South Australia's energy crisis has taken an unprecedented turn. The national regulator has announced it's taking control of the electricity market for the first time in history. It comes amid fresh warnings. Parts of our state will be plunged into darkness within hours. A childcare sex predator who abused children in his care has been jailed for 14 years. And Australia's lowest paid workers are said to receive an extra $40 a week in their pay packets. The Fair Work Commission expects the changes to take effect from the first pay period after the 1st of July. Social media platform Instagram has unveiled a raft of new features to better protect its teenage users. As Sean White explains, the tools will give parents more access and insight into what their kids are up to. Whether you're liking, commenting or simply scrolling online, Instagram's Family Centre aims to provide a safer experience for kids. What they're really designed to do is get that balance right for young people. Let them have autonomy and privacy in how they use Instagram. Well, the headline feature, a supervision tool. Parents will be able to see who their children follow or are followed by. Accounts they report directly to Instagram and the exact time spent on the platform. They can just say, you know, hey, what's going on here and really open up that conversation. Sophie Spooner is a mum and stepmum of four based on Sydney's Northern Beaches. I guess it's just trying to strike that balance between giving him freedom online, but then also being mindful that he might not have the maturity to deal with some of the issues that can come up. Instagram will also have a feature called Family Hub that's built into the app where parents can access resources from Butterfly, Origin, Project Rocket, Reach Out and eSafety. This would include articles, videos and tips on topics like how to talk to young people about social media. Your average teen uses around four social media services and that actually increases as they get older. So by the time they're 16 or 17, it could be five or six social media platforms. So there has to be a time during the adolescence where parents regularly talk to their child about their social media use and they make decisions together. Sean White, 7 News. Checking finance now with Stephen Daglian at Comsec. And good afternoon, Steve. The losing streak continues for the Australian share market. 
Good afternoon, Mike. Exactly right. Unfortunately, four straight days of declines now. We fall 1.3% today. We've fallen about 7% or close to it over the past four sessions as well. So last week, our market was already doing quite poorly because of the biggest rate hike we had in over 20 years, a half a percent lift last Tuesday. But in this week, all eyes have been on the United States because tomorrow morning, we could very well get the biggest rate hike since 1994 in the United States, That's something that could uh, certainly continue continue to rattle markets. Today, though, we had losses really across the board. Uh, we had all 11 sectors in negative territory. We're continuing to see a falls for some of those interest rate sensitive areas of our market, including tech stocks. Uh, they fell heavily from companies like Zip, App and Zero, and also Megaport. Property companies continue to also lose a bit of ground. We had two survey results today, um, which basically asked people questions about how they're feeling about their finances. And it's not surprising to see that consumer confidence is neither worse its been uh, at, at any time during the pandemic. So we are continuing to see retailers struggle from Harvey Norman to JB Hi-Fi as well. We had the banks doing reasonably well this morning, but they faded into the afternoon. And some of the winners included Telstra, which rose about 2%. Some of the insurers bounced back from losses yesterday. Suncorp and IAG were up, as were some of the grain handlers like Grain Corp. The Aussie dollar finally is sitting at about 69.1 US cents. Thanks, Steve. Well, it's taken them 10 attempts to get there, but a group of 19 women has broken the country's skydiving record for the largest all-female star formation. They nailed the manoeuvre over the weekend, jumping from 15,000 feet in minus six degree weather. The group came from across Australia and are aged from 27 to 59. The previous record was 16 women. Glad they got it right. Hey, CEO, time for sport and, in my opinion, taken far too long, but yes. Russell Ebert has finally been made a legend of the AFL. Well, the most exclusive club, isn't it? And we hear from his son, Brett, after the break. It was just a wonderful night for the Ebert family, for Port Adelaide and for anyone in the community that was lucky enough to see him. Fantastic honour for the Ebert clan. Coming up after the break, a key Adelaide trio hits the track as the Crows look to block out the Suns on the Gold Coast. And Nature Over Nurture, Australia's best sprinter, dominates at Royal Ascot. Hello again, Russell Ebert has been handed football's highest individual honour being elevated to legend status in the AFL Hall of Fame. With more than 20 family members in attendance, the honour was collected on stage by his wife, Diane. There was no room in his, in his office for any more trophies and medallions, but um, everything that he won, he, uh, he put back on other people. We're going to have much more on the career of the great Russell Ebert and reaction from Brett tonight at six o'clock. Well, Adelaide will make at least three changes for Sunday's Suns clash on the Gold Coast. Defenders Jordan Butts and Luke Brown got through this morning's session, while live wire forward Josh Rochelle looked back to full fitness after battling a nasty cork in recent weeks. It's funny, when footy gets taken away from you, when you're a young fella too, you miss one or two weeks, you're pretty keen to get back out there and play, and he certainly had a fair bit of enthusiasm today at training. Young forward Lockie Gallant has signed a new two-year deal. While there was some selection intrigue with Riley Thilthorpe spending some time with the Sandful squad, but he's still well and truly in the mix we'll for Sunday. We'll get the extended bench and, and probably see a little bit more from training Friday before we categorically make decisions on anyone. And All-Australian defender Sarah Allen has signed on until the end of 2023. Anyone at this club, after you know coming off the success we've had, um, there would be interest from um, other clubs. But yeah, obviously, just love what we've built, um, and I love being a part of um, this culture and this club. The Crows women start pre-season training on Saturday. Former Glenelg star Sam Durden will play his first game for Carlton against Richmond at the MCG tomorrow night just two weeks after being picked up in the mid-season draft. Dustin Martin is in doubt for the Tigers with illness. Melbourne skipper Max Gorn could miss up to five weeks with an ankle injury. And South Aussie Western Bulldogs defender Caleb Daniel will stay at Wittenoval for another four years after signing a new deal. Jewel Sandfield Premiership coach Jade Sheedy will miss Saturday's Eagles clash with Central District due to health and safety protocols. Sheedy is the seventh Sandfield coach this year to miss a game with COVID. He'll be replaced by Eagles forward line leader Troy Hall. Woodville West Torrens midfield maestro Riley Knight missed round six with COVID but remains a top McGarry medal fancy. If you do get that accolade at the end of the year, it's, it's amazing. Um, but at the moment, we're focused on winning games and, and getting through the finals. And, and like I said, hopefully playing in another premiership would be, be very special.
Meantime, rising star Indy Rashid has two nominations for the Sandful Women's Goal of the Year. Can anything go any better than that? Including three in the semi final. North Adelaide Premiership star Jade DeMello has also been nominated. We'll reveal the winner in our six o'clock bulletin. Our World Cup bound Socceroos fly back into Australia this evening to celebrate with family after yesterday's dramatic playoff win against Peru. Obviously, we've enjoyed the night and the celebrations. Some of the boys are still going downstairs at the pool. Um, but, yeah, I don't think it's really sunk in yet. It's probably going to take a few days. Fair enough, too. New Zealand won't be joining us in Qatar. They lost their playoff against Costa Rica 1-0 for the final place at the World Cup. Well, he may be turning 36 in a few months, but David Warner showed he's as sharp as ever. Oh, that's unbelievable. What a catch that is by David Warner. Certainly is. Ashton Agar couldn't believe his eyes. Chasing a rain-reduced 282, Glenn Maxwell kept his cool after a mini batting collapse. His unbeaten 80 off 51 led Australia to a two-wicket win. An old-school English batting collapse looked on the cards on the final day of the second test against New Zealand. At three for 56, up stepped Johnny Bairstow. Stand and deliver, Johnny Bairstow. Chasing 299 off only 72 overs, Bairstow smashed England's second fastest ever test ton from 77 rocks. He's 136 alongside an unbeaten 75 from skipper Ben Stokes, driving the five-wicket win and an unassailable 2-0 series lead. Cam Smith's confident he can break his major drought at this week's US Open at Brookline in Massachusetts. The Aussie world number six says... He's getting much more support from tour crowds after his win at the Players' Championship in March. So I think there's a little bit of a different uh, vibe on the golf course as well towards me. I think there's um, maybe a few more people rooting for me, uh, which is nice. The US Open starts tomorrow night. Serena Williams will make her long-awaited return to tennis at Wimbledon in just under a fortnight. The 23-time Grand Slam champ announced her All-England comeback on social media, Williams hasn't played since Wimbledon last year because of a knee injury. Nick Kyrgios is through to the second round of the lead-up event in Germany where he'll take on world number six, Stefanos Tsitsipas. Well, Chris Waller's nature strip has once again shown he's the best sprinter in the world. With royalty watching on on day one at Royal Ascot, James McDonald piloted the Everest winner to victory in the Group 1 Kings Stand Stakes. Nature Stripe leading to Acklam Express in second place. Twilight Course coming home in third position. But it is the great Australian sprinter, Nature Stripe and James McDonald. And look how far they've won by. It's Australia's first Royal Ascot win since Black Caviar in 2012. Nature Stripe, we prefer to call it by its <laughs> correct name, Nature Strip, but well done to the clan. Of course, we're live at Port Adelaide training tonight, the first AFLW training session. Smith O ahead of next season. It's massive and we're going to catch up with Aaron Phillips too, live from Alberton. Great night for it too. Brilliant. <laughs> Pouring was rain. We're expecting a shower or two tomorrow before a mostly dry start to the weekend. Amelia will join us live with all the details next. G'day there, Anthony White from the Oporto Traffic Centre. In the city, Rundle Road is closed between East Terrace and Kettleville Terrace. That's for the Illuminate Festival. Also got some change traffic conditions at Darlington today. New Asheville's gone down on South Road, speeds at 40 k's. That's just near Marion Road as well. Right now to Porto, grab yourself a Bondo Burger meal for just $9.95 or a whole chicken meal for just $24.95. Limited time only. Head into your nearest to Porto today. That's the latest in traffic. Now back to you, Mike. Thanks for that, Anthony. Now let's get a final check on the weather this afternoon. Amelia again joins us live in Mills. How long can we expect our wet weather to last? Well, Mike, maybe only a day or so of showers left and dry skies by the weekend. And there is always a silver lining to days like this, though, with Jane Hill snapping this rainbow over Borough today. A perfect one, as she describes it. Now, she sent it into the 7 News Adelaide Weather Group on Facebook and says she'd like a little bit more rain, though. Maybe a better shot at that next week, Jane. Showers are easing this afternoon. We've already seen the bulk of that wet weather over the city today. Overnight, we stayed in the double digits. Our low was 11.9 degrees and we hit a top of 16.2 just before 1 o'clock this 
this afternoon. Now, we have seen northwesterly winds today generally, but they have begun to swing southwesterly this afternoon. Right now, it's sitting at 15 degrees in the city. It feels more like 13. Elsewhere, there are showers around Melbourne this afternoon as well. It feels like one degree there currently. A sunny afternoon further up the east coast, 20 at the moment in Brisbane and in Perth. Now, looking ahead for SA... And the low-pressure system and trough that have delivered today's wet weather will clear to the east by tomorrow. A high is developing in our west, and that will slowly head east over coming days as well, working to clear skies as it goes. For now, staying sunny across our far north tomorrow, Murray and Moomba going for a top of 21 degrees, 20 for Cooper Pedy. Mostly sunny days on the way for Sejuna and 19. Now, you can't rule out a bit of early fog there. And about Air Peninsula and the Flinders too, Port Lincoln, Wyala, Port Augusta are all going for a top of 18 degrees. Now, there is still a slight chance of a shower over some of those centres but they are more likely about the mid-north and south-east. So a shower or two on the way for Kadena, uh, up to 17 there and in Victor Harbour. Dry and 18 in Kingscote, Murray Bridge and Renmark with a top of 15 degrees on the way for Mount Gambier. And in the outback there's a warning for flooding about the Diamantina and Warburton rivers while strong winds will remain about the lower south-east coast tomorrow. In the city, down to 11 degrees overnight, then a top of 17's on the way. We are expecting a shower or two but they'll probably be in the morning, drying out on Friday and mostly sunny by Saturday, Smitho. Thanks, Mills. Let's hope so. Well, that's all from 7 Adelaide's afternoon news team. Jane will have our next bulletin at 6. I'll be back tomorrow at 11.30 and 4. But for now, it's bye.